The point of talking about socialist revolution uh, may seem slightly odd because uh, we don't believe in blueprints. But I think there is a case for saying that we should be discussing what we mean by socialist revolution from two points of view. The first one is simply that we have a completely different conception of what socialism is about from the reformists and the Stalinists and so on. We need to uh, argue that. The second reason is quite simply that we base all our arguments about socialism on historical experience, the historic experience of the working class. And actually, we have quite a lot of historical experience of the working class, and we can actually generalize from it. And there's another reason, which is quite simply that five times in the last 14 years, the question of socialist revolution has in different countries been on the practical agenda, and five times in the last 14 years, we've failed. Now, the, movement, the working class movement has failed to, cre to create a socialist revolution when it had the possibility. France, 1968. Chile in the early 1970s. Portugal in the mid-70s. The Iranian Revolution. Could, you know, there was a sizable working class in Iran, as big certainly as the Russian working class in 1917 in proportional terms. And again, in most tragically, most recently in Poland in uh, 1981. The question of socialist revolution is not something which is about some distant future. It's about our period. We live in the epoch of wars and revolutions. And we have to discuss the question as a practical series of questions, and not simply as some utopian dream about the future. We all hope, and it is not an utopian unreasonable hope, that, many, that most of us will actually live to participate in a socialist revolution. Now, I'll start by saying that the socialist revolution is not an immediate leap into a full-blown socialist or communist society. It's the beginning. When we talk about socialist revolution, about the insurrection and so on, what we're talking about is the beginning of the transformation of society. The very first process is the beginning of the transformation of society. The beginning of working class power. And that's what I want to talk about. Not the final goal, which none of us will ever live to see. A completely classless society without a state in which men and women are genuinely, truly free and equal and so on. But the existing state, the state that we are under now, is the most serious obstacle to working class power. Other than the psychology of the working class itself, which doesn't believe at this moment that it can take power. The state is the most powerful impediment to socialist revolution. And because it is the most powerful impediment, the socialist revolution begins with the smashing of that state. That's why the socialist revolution begins, with the smashing of the existing state as a barrier to the development of socialism. Now why? Why, why, why? why must the state be cleared out of the way? Fundamentally, because the, the existing state is a system of social relationships, of subordination, of bossing, of keeping people in their place, excluding the mass of the population from their from self-government, from power. The modern state is constructed as, as bureaucracy, as secrets, as power over us and not our power, as a policeman, with, as the policeman with his truncheon out of our control, the judge the senior so-called civil servant, humorously entitled civil servant, not very civil and certainly not a servant. The, and so it is ruled by the existing state is a form of rule by the minorities, a form of class rule. The army, the police, the civil service, the judiciary and so on. And all of that is constructed from the top down on a bureaucratic principle. And it stands in the way of democracy. It is impossible for the working class to use the existing form of the state if it's going to rule society. And it has to be cleared out of the way. Now, it's not only that, it's also secret. It, it operates on the principle not of openness and uh, public accountability, but on the principle of secrecy. You know, the most the famous example very recently of the Labour government secretly deciding to spend a thousand million pounds on upgrading the Chevalier, uh, the, the Polaris submarine program, prior submarine with the Chevalier program, without even telling the whole of the cabinet, uh, let alone the parliament and let alone us. The, there are all sorts of methods by which the existing state preserves itself from popular control. The police, if you want to make a complaint against the police in Britain, 
then you make your complaint and this is then investigated, of course, by police, not by us. If you want to uh, find out something about what is going on in government, time and again you come up against the barrier which said a door comes down, a steel shutter, mark official secret. You cannot know this, you cannot know that. It's not many military secrets and diplomatic secrets, but also, for example, if you're an MP, one of the most uh, powerless people in Britain, and you want to know, for example, why it is that the DHSS did not give benefit uh, to one of your uh, constituents, then you find that suddenly there's a door that comes down marked official secrets. If you're an MP, you're told, well, you can't actually answer this. You can't ask that question. Here's your question back. You're not allowed to have an answer to that. That's out of the power of Parliament to, to know. Uh, if you go to court, as happens to some comrades, and uh, you express an opinion about the personality of the judge, uh, suggesting that he's not an entirely reputable character, let's say, uh, you are liable to be sent to prison for contempt of court. There is, quite interestingly, no parallel or equivalent charge which you can bring against the judge. Contempt of people, for example. There's a, an imbalance in the court where the judge is protected, the court is protected against the people. So the whole system of the state in every realm is a system of exclusion of us from the control and power. Now, quite simply, if the working class is to grow to power, then it has quite simply to begin the process of taking power with the destruction of that state. The beginning its process of controlling society with the destruction of that state. And every revolution therefore begins with, with the destruction of the old state. Whether it's a bourgeois revolution or a socialist revolution, it begins always with the destruction of the existing state. And out of that emerges a new kind of power, whose fundamental principle is popular democracy in the case of the Socialist Revolution. Marx wrote about it in his writings on the Paris Commune, a magnificent pamphlet, The Civil War in France, in which he writes about the central principles of the Commune having been in the Commune, workers discovered for the first time the central principles of working class government. And it's worth reminding ourselves what those were. The first element is quite simply that the army and the police, the standing army and the standing police, specialised people specialising in violence against society. And that, those bodies had to be dissolved and replaced, be replaced with workers' militia, with, as Marx put it, the armed people. Now, we have to be quite clear, of course, that the armed people does not mean, say, what, what exists in some parts of the United States. Everybody carrying a gun. And I was in the States several years ago, and uh, we had a, there was a situation where there was an oil shortage, and the people were queuing in petrol line, you know, queuing for petrol, and somebody uh, jumped the queue and somebody else got out of his car and shot him. That is not what we mean by the armed working class. It may well have been a worker that shot another worker. That is not what's meant, you know, and it doesn't mean machine gun under the stairs in every house. What it does mean, of course, quite simply, that arms come under the collective control of the working class. You talk about shop stewards committee and so on, controlling arms. A very good way of defending the country is an alternative to the nuclear method. Um, it also means, of course, related to nuclear weapons, that nuclear weapons are out. Because you can't have democratic control with nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are impossible as a form of uh, weapon used by a workers' government. Simply because they are genocidal, they don't discriminate between friend and foe, and uh, they're quite in, you can't use nuclear weapons uh, democratically. You can't have a referendum on whether to have a nuclear war or not. Now, that's the first principle, simply the abolition of standing armies, standing police forces, the replacement with democratic militia. The second is that, as discovered also in the Paris Commune, the government by delegates. Government, all government, all functions of government carried out by elected people were elected and always, like the, the shop steward in the well-organized factory, always subject to recall by those elect, who elect them. Thirdly, that every public office is under this rule. Not simply that those who make the laws, make the rules, are elected, but also all those who carry them out. So it isn't simply a question of electing uh, MPs, but also, of course, there is no such figure as James Anderton in uh, Manchester, where I come from, uh, an unelected appointed police chief who's an extremely political figure who heads a bureaucracy of police, etc., etc., like an army, um, which acts like an invading army against the working class and so on. Anybody in that sort of position, anybody holding any sort of public office, 
as a judge, as a so-called civil servant, whatever it might be, has to be elected. Anybody having any, any power. All positions with any kind of responsibility or power, people have to be elected to them, subject to recall, regardless of whether they're legislators or executives or, or judiciaries or whatever. And of course, this principle, this is something which Marx didn't talk about so much in the 19th century, but every Marxist in the 20th century has had to talk about it, because of the way in which the working class movement has quite naturally developed. The question of democracy extends not only to the world of politics, but also to the world of production. Something which we have to emphasize because it's missing from a whole system of uh, so-called socialist traditions that we also very much stress the importance of working class democratic control over the processes of production and distribution and so on, of, of economic life and not merely of politics. Now, it's only in such a completely democratic form that the working class can expect, to de can develop its capacity to rule society. None of us at this moment is capable of ruling society. And the fundamental reason is why is because we're not used to it. We have actually to grow into the capacity of ruling society. Millions and millions of us for years and years have learned the habits of subordination and getting up for the alarm clock and doing what we are told. We learn it at school, we learn it at work, we learn it in the dole queue, we learn it even to queue properly in the post office. We learn the habit of subordination of doing what we're told. We have actually to grow in our own capacity to rule. Marx argued that there were two reasons why you need a socialist, why you need a revolution. The first uh, reason was quite simply the ruling class will not give up power without a revolution. And the second, he said, was an extremely important reason, which was that in no other way can the working class gain, uh, overcome what he called the muck of ages. The racism, the sexism, the habit of subordination, all those things, it's only actually in the act of trans self-transformation which is involved in the socialist revolution that people actually can gain the capacity to rule society. We are not, until the revolution, capable of ruling society. It's the very act of making the revolution which transforms us. Now, only within a, a completely democratic framework can we expand our capacity, can we afford to make the kinds of mistakes and so on, through which we actually grow in our capacity to rule society. Now that's fine, that's, that's, it's clear from uh, our whole tradition that that's what uh, the initial aim is, the creation of such a, a completely democratic system of society is bound. That's what we mean by social revolution. How does such a possibility arise? Well, I think we can say and here we, we haven't got so much generalizing literature. We can say that uh, it's quite clear that every time a revolutionary possibility has come to exist, something has happened, and we, we call it quite simply a crisis. And Lenin discusses the, the, this question in left-wing communism, and he says quite simply, every crisis, every revolutionary crisis consists of two elements. The first element is that the ruling class is no longer able to continue ruling in the old way. They have lost the capacity to rule as they used to because of an upsurge from below. They are fragmented suddenly, they've lost their, their cohesion, uh, their forces are no longer at their command. That's the first thing. The second thing which characterizes the revolutionary situation is that the oppressed and the exploited classes are no longer willing to be ruled in the old way. And when you have the combination of those two elements, then you have a revolutionary crisis. Now, alas, not every revolutionary crisis turns into a revolution. Every pre-revolutionary situation does not become a revolution. But that situation is a necessity for revolution. That's why a revolution will not happen starting today in Britain, because it is not the case in Britain today. Let's hope for tomorrow it will be different. But today, it is not the case that the ruling class has lost its ability to rule in the old way, and that the working class is no longer willing to be ruled in the old way, in an active sense. That's not true yet. Now, when you have that kind of situation, then the whole of society is thrown into the melting pot. All the rules, everything is thrown into the melting pot. All social relationships, all political power is thrown into the melting pot. And the question becomes quite simply, who rules? Who is going to rule and how? That's when the possibility of the social revolution actually being carried through to completion exists. But only in that situation. Now, if you ask how those situations emerge, the answer is that there isn't an answer. Because there's always an initiating event, something that starts the process off, um, a spark 
it sets the prairie alight, as it were. There's always that spark, but nobody can ever predict what it is. And in every, I think in every historical revolutionary situation that you can find, it's always different. In 1871, in Paris, it was the fact that uh, the French government tried to take back from the working class the canon which the workers had patriotically subscribed to, to fight the Prussians. And that act so angered the workers that the Paris Commune began from that moment. The first uh, clearly socialist, re socialist revolutionary attempt in history in 1871 begins with workers defending their, something which they've done on the basis of patriotism. In, uh, in other revolutions, it's different. In, that, in other revolutionary possibilities emerge in quite different circumstances. In 1968 in France, 30,000 students fighting the police all night on the barricade. In another circumstance, it's uh, Anna Valentinovich in Gdansk, a woman train driver being sacked by the uh, shipyard management and a few workers deciding to organize a strike in their support. And that leads to the creation of solidarity, which throws the whole of Polish society into crisis. The initiating event can be anything. We really, it can be anything. It can be a bread riot, it can be, it could be anything. Maybe it will be something, that very likely, when the revolution comes in Britain, it will start over something we never thought a revolution would start over. An art exhibition, a television program, who knows? It can be anything. And we, the great thing is that you never know what's coming, you never know what it's going to be, and it's always a surprise. Always a surprise. It's a surprise to the ruling class, obviously, but it's also a surprise to the people who start the revolution. They never expect it to begin in that way. I was in France in 1968, not so you know, May 1960, I was there in Easter, and uh, Rudi Dukster, the German student leader, had been shot in Berlin, and there was a student demonstration in support of Rudi Dukster six weeks before the Battle of the Barricades. And you, obviously, if there were 30,000 students fighting on the barricades in May, at Easter there must have been a very big demonstration for Rudy Dutschke. Well, it was very big. There were 150 people on it. And as soon as the police emerged, appeared, the students all ran away. And we, uh, Eva and I were with uh, a French student who was a syndicalist, and he said, French students, he said, are such cowards. They always run away from the police. If only we lived in Britain, he said. Grosvenor Square, that's where all the action is, and so on. Six weeks later, who remembered Grosvenor Square? Paris was alive. There was this fantastic transformation. It was a surprise even to somebody who dreamed that it would happen in France. Total surprise. Everybody was surprised. And therefore, there's always that element of surprise, or what is sometimes called spontaneity, about the initiation of revolutionary situation. Now, once that, once that crisis has emerged, once you have that situation in which the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way, the working class and other oppressed and exploited sectors of society are no longer willing to be ruled in the old way, then you have brought into play in society a whole welter of different political and social forces. Everybody comes in on the act. The churches come in on the act with a program, well, probably five different programs, ten different programs from ten, ten different sections of ten different churches, for a solution to the problem. Uh, political parties, new political parties, old political parties, they fall apart, they reorganize, and so on. There are a thousand and one solutions offered. All of them except one have one failing. All of them except one will propose the demobilization of the working class as part of their solution. There's one solution which doesn't, it's called the revolutionary so solution. There are all sorts of competing ideas which come forward in a crisis of that sort. It's not merely that it is either the revolution or the counter-revolution. There are all sorts of schemes for reform and all sorts of schemes for this sort of movement and that sort of movement and so on and so on. And out of all that wealth and in one of all that welter of ideas and confusion of tongues and so on, in the middle of all that there has to be one voice that is very clear that says the working class must take power. And that has to talk very concretely and carefully and clearly about what that means in the particular circumstances. And that's, uh, that's why we organize now and hope that uh, we will actually have the opportunity to be that clear voice. Now, the tempo of development of, of such a situation is one which is very much faster than anything that we're used to. Everything moves much faster, everything moves on a grander scale than in 
the kind of life that we experience under Thatcher at the moment. And the role of the Revolutionary Party in that circumstance is absolutely crucial. It's not something which can be created in the moment of the revolution, the Revolutionary Party, alas. It has to be built before because it needs to be able to be cohesive, it needs to be able to speak with a clear voice and, and so on. It needs to be able to speak to the working class, it needs to be able to speak of the working class and among the working class and to be of the working class in, in speaking. It can't suddenly claim the right at the last minute to speak, it has already to have won it before. That's why it's terribly important, the question of building organisation now. It has not only to be able to speak to the working class, but also to the potential allies of the working class. Because there are sections of society who are not in the working class, who nonetheless have to be one and can be one behind the revolution. Now, it's also the case in that kind of situation. And I think you can say this looking at every revolution that's existed, every revolutionary situation that exist, has existed, that to the degree that a socialist revolution is really possible, you, can see, you will see it prefigured before the seizure of power in all sorts of developments amongst the workers. The movements to control rent or refuse to pay rent, movements to take over production in factories, movements to control the distribution of food, movements to set up workers' militia, it will not be the case that the workers' militia is established on the day of the insurrection. It has to be established before. In all sorts of ways, workers begin to prefigure the socialist revolution in the crisis before the actual insurrection. If they haven't done, then the insurrection is not yet ready. We have to be quite clear about that. Now, the climax of this development, of course, is the actual insurrection, and which is the taking, the testing, in a sense, of the revolutionary forces against the old state power. The attempt, the, the, there's no way in which that moment can be avoided. Everybody uh, that wishes to avoid that moment in a revolution is an opportunist, a reformist, whatever you want to call them. In the end, they prove absolutely useless. There is a moment in every revolution when a decision has to be made to test the power of the working class, the military power of the working class, against the military power of the old state. That has to involve the breaking of the power of the army, the breaking of the power of the police, and so on. And there is no way in which such a moment can be evaded. It's at that moment of civil war. It may be a moment of civil war that, as in the case of Russia, tragically lasts for a number of years. Or it may be a moment which uh, may be fairly brief. But the moment itself, long or short, is unavoidable. Because it's only on the basis of having destroyed completely the old state power and established a new state power on the basis of working class democracy that the proceed you can then proceed, as Lenin put it beautifully, and I would love to be able to say this again one day myself, and so would all of us and here, we shall now proceed to the construction of socialism. That, uh, that moment is, uh, long or short, is, is the crucial transition. Now, obviously, I don't want to say very much about this because uh, you could spend a whole uh, uh, five hours discussing why. If any revolution is to succeed, it has to spread. The, uh, the idea of socialism in one country, as we know, and it's part of our tradition, is uh, a completely bankrupt idea. There are all sorts of way, points of view from which we could discuss this. I just want to talk about one, which is this that if you want to have a democratic militia as the form of force, the organization of force in society, then you have, in fact, spread the revolution. Because if you are faced as the Bolsheviks were, for example, in the Russian Revolution, with an invasion from, I can't remember how many armies, on how many different fronts, and you're forced to fight for two years uh, a bloody civil war, you cannot fight that civil war with a democratic militia because you will not win. You have to look at what happened to the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune had more armed forces than the invading army. The Paris Commune was organized democratically and the army that invaded was organized undemocratically. The army that invaded won. It is not simply a question of politics and not simply a question of numbers. There is a degeneration process involved in, the, in, the, in a long process of uh, fighting for the salvation of the revolution, because it is technically necessary, unfortunately, to re-centralize power more than we would consider desirable. The process of the degeneration of the Russian Revolution didn't begin in 1923, as Trotsky believed. It began in the period of the Civil War. It began very early, in the loss of working class power. 
in the inability of the workers in, in that kind of situation, in fact, to maintain their power. And therefore, the question of internationalism, of spreading the revolution, is an urgent question for the inner life of the revolution. Very, very important question, because otherwise it degenerates. And the possibility of degeneration of the Russian Revolution is something of which we have to be, we are obviously more aware in the whole, having behind us the whole experience of the loss of the Russian Revolution. Something I think which probably you can say the comrades of the Bolshevik party were not aware. Nothing like that had ever happened before. We have to be terribly aware of it. Now I want to end really by talking about a few problems of uh, the immediate aftermath of the Socialist Revolution. Let's just assume we won. Just uh, for the sake of the argument, let us assume that we won the civil war and we now have workers' power. And we are spreading. And we are now facing the real questions of constructing a socialist order. The first thing I think we have to recognize, and we have to be very, very non utopian about this, is that uh, every revolution is produced by a crisis. And usually there is an economic element in that crisis. And every revolution, furthermore, because it is a tremendous, creates tremendous chaos in society, makes the crisis worse. You have to assume that we will begin the process of the construction of socialism with a, an economy that is in total chaos, where it is, there are queues for food, there are fantastic shortages, the distribution system is disrupted, etc., etc. We don't inherit the best of capitalism, we will inherit the very worst, and we will make it worse in the very process of making the revolution. Inevitably, there will be destruction and so on. You have to assume we start from a terrible chaos and a crisis in the economy. I don't think we should assume that everything will start with the sunshine. We have to assume it will be raining hard and cold and sleet and all the rest of it. Now, the real problems, therefore, are posed for the working class of whether, in fact, the working class can, under its own steam, in that crisis, lift the economy out of crisis under its own control. There's a discussion by George Lukács, the Hungarian Marxist, of the Russian Revolution and its dilemmas, which he wrote in 1919. It's a very abstract sort of discussion, but he poses a very important question. He says, fundamentally, either the working class re-establishes its own discipline over production and its own control over production, or somebody else will have to do it. Because it is a vital necessity for life that the economy should be got going again, that the food distribution system should be revived, etc., etc. Everybody needs it. Either the working class will do it, or somebody else will have to do it to the working class and, and, and for the working class. And in that case, we're talking about the beginning of the degeneration of the revolution. Now, the problem of solving the economic crisis isn't simply, it seems to me, one or an economic problem. It's actually the central political problem of developing the socialist revolution, of developing socialism. It's, develop it's a question of developing the practical capacity of the working class to rule itself, of it developing its own capacity to rule itself. Faced with a very concrete question about what do we do faced with this crisis? How are we going to handle it? We under our own control, we who have never ruled society before, how do we now take power? How do we exercise power? How, it's not simply a question now of seizing power, it's a question of using it. And in a sense, we have to say that the measure of socialist development, you know, people talk about economic growth and economic development and so on, bourgeois economists talk about this all the time. For us, we will have a completely different measure of economic development from the bourgeoisie. Because the bourgeoisie is concerned with accumulation and therefore is concerned with the production of goods, the expanded production of goods. We have to be concerned, obviously, with the expanded production of goods, but also we have to be concerned with the expanded self-production of people, the growth and development of all of us as individuals and our capacity to rule. That is a fantastic measure of development under socialism, of the development of people. And the crisis will pose that question very, very early. It isn't something that can be put off to the future. Whether or not we will, as a working class, say, in Britain, in Europe, have the capacity to rule is something we have still to measure in the scales of history. In sense. We have to recognize that the Russian workers did not succeed. By the time that production in, in Russia was back at the level of before the revolution, by the mid-1920s, they had revived production, but it was no longer under workers' control. There were red so-called red bosses. 
in the factories. The, 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 the mere remnants of workers' control. The working class had lost power by 1925 in uh, any meaningful sense. It was not the case that the revival of the Russian economy was carried out under the control of the working class. There is no historical experience of the working class controlling the economy. It will be an entirely new experience for us. And therefore, we will have to have a very non-utopian measure of success. If we can succeed, in the, if the working class can succeed, in reviving production to the level that capitalism achieved at its best, nothing, not of building anything new, just of getting production back to what it was like before Dennis Healy, let's say, right, to full employment and, uh, and presumably also shortening of working hours and raising of wages and all those things, of course, which will be part of the socialist revolution and a reorganization of the priorities. If we can re-establish production at that level, under the control of the working class, as though the working class itself is true, it will be the most fantastic moral and historical victory of the working class that is imaginable. We don't have to dream of something immense for the future, some new forms of production and so on, just to get production back at that level will be the most fantastic achievement the working class has ever done in the history of the world. We have yet to experience it. Now, a second question, it seems to me, which we need to talk about very briefly, is the question of uh, our relationships with other classes. Um, in particular, it seems to me there is something which we need to discuss very briefly about the question of the petty bourgeoisie, and insofar as it exists in Britain, the peasantry. More, it's a more important question in France and, uh, in, obviously, in third world countries, or so semi-peripheral countries and so on. People like small shopkeepers, peasants, self-employed plumbers and uh, window cleaners and small garage proprietors and all those sorts of people. We have to take an attitude to them. And it will determine partly our attitude to what sort of economy and what sort of society we actually believe that we're talking about when we talk about the establishment of workers' power. Because clearly when we're talking about those people, we're not talking about workers. We're talking about another class or classes. We're talking about people who are in Britain, for example, the backbone of the Tory party. The enemy, we think, the enemy. And yet, it seems to me that we'll have to say that the winning of strata like those to the revolution will be crucial to the victory of the revolution. Whether we win them grudgingly, whether we win them uh, sometimes with a little bit of uh, coercion and so on, nonetheless, we have to win them. If the whole of the petty bourgeoisie, it's a very big class still in Britain, if the whole of the petty bourgeoisie stands against the working class, actually it will influence the working class and the working class will be split. We have actually to talk about winning the so-called middle classes, the middle layers. Not, of course, the ruling class. We will never win the ruling class to socialism. We will have to think of other things to do about them. But um, we have to, the success of the revolution depends on an alliance, in a sense, established as in the Russian Revolution between the workers and the peasants. Also, although in materially different circumstances, in a, an imaginable, realistically imaginable, socialist revolution in Britain. And I think we have to be clear about something, and it's this, that petty property is not fundamentally our enemy. We are not necessarily in favour of the immediate nationalisation of the corner shop, of the window cleaning business, etc., etc. We are not certainly in favour, and uh, this is quite clear if you read Marx and Engels in the 19th century, we are certainly not in favour of the seizure of small peasant plots. And if anybody here is an allotment holder for a local authority, I mean, there is no reason for the socialist revolution to come along and say you can't have your allotment anymore, it's being nationalised, etc., etc. There is no re Marx was fantastic. I mean, Commons would be astonished to hear what Marx thought about the peasants. He was in favour of maintaining the right of inheritance of property amongst the small peasants, that the peasant could hand on his land to his son, and so on. And he saw it as a necessary guarantee of uh, the socialist revolution. Engels, indeed, declared that defending the interests of the pe small peasant was, as he put it, and I quote, in the interests of the party. Believe it or not, you might be rather surprised to learn that we will have to defend, and it seems by, by now, we will also have to defend the property of the small shopkeeper in the interests of the party. You can go and tell your local news agent that, so uh, that, you know, it'll be all right, really. Um, you see, the process, the socialist revolution is not merely the emancipation, self emancipation of the working class, it is also the emancipation by the working class of the rest of society from capitalism. 
You see, the, con the Stalinists who collectivised the, the agriculture, collectivised agriculture by force in 1929, 1930, 1931 in Russia, broke completely with the principles of Marxism. They carried out a process of theft from the people. The Russian Revolution gave the peasants the land. The Stalinists sold it back again. That's the real history of the collectivization of agriculture in Russia. And we have to say, I mean, there's a very nice article by Old Cliff, actually, um, on uh, small on agriculture, which is, I have much regret, it's not reprinted really in this uh, little collection of articles by him. And he says, quite rightly, that after the Socialist Revolution, there will be a flourishing, not a reduction, but a flourishing of small business. Well, actually, Mrs. Thatcher talks about the flourishing of small business. We really will offer the flourishing of small business. The small businessman, actually, you know, the really petty small shopkeeper and so on, will actually get a bit of help from us instead of being squeezed and robbed by the big monopolies and so on, to the extent that people provide a service that nobody else provides to the working class. The working class has got an interest in having good service, for heaven's sake, in having its consumption levels raised and so on. If somebody is willing to run some wretched shop on a corner and keep it open at night, they should be paid more, for heaven's sake, and given a bit of credit from the bank and the rest of it to enable them to do this and uh, give them assistance to pay better wages and the rest of it. That's the truth of the matter. The small peasantry will have to be given all sorts of investment resources and so on to enable them in uh, countries where the peasantry still exists, which it hardly does in Britain, to in fact expand food production for the workers in fact to eat. Now, the real enemy, it seems to me, of the working class is not the petty bourgeoisie, it is capital. It is, the it is not the market even that is the, the real enemy of socialism. It is the power of capital. It is bossing. It is the power that goes with the possession of capital and so on. And the real enemy is not the small shopkeeper. It is the boss, whether the boss is called the capitalist or whether the boss is called the state bureaucrat. They're, they're the real enemies of working class power, which we will have to confirm. Now that means, thirdly, that we'll have to take a quite uh, answer perhaps what may seem to some comments to be a slightly surprising attitude to questions to do with planning and the market. Because from the Stalinists, we inherit a notion of talking about planning where we believe that perfect planning is everybody doing the unpredictable. That everybody will you'll be able to predict with a, perhaps a very sophisticated computer and a sophistic sufficiently sophisticated computer program what everybody will be doing for every minute of the day. And you have a completely planned society. You want to be one of those people who's predictable for every minute of the day? You think about it. Uh, you want the dream of the perfectly planned economy and the perfectly planned society in that sense is not anything to do with socialism. It's a bureaucrat's nightmare or dream, depending on how the bureaucrat sees it. It's science fiction. It's not what we should be aiming for at all. In that sense of the perfect planning where everything moves at an allotted moment and so on. It is the way capitalism wishes to organize. It's the way Ford wants to reorganize its factories. There was a comrade from Ford talking yesterday about the Japanization of Ford. That's how they want to organize Ford. Everything will be predictable down to the last minute. It's capital. It's the state that likes to think in those terms, everything being neat and tidy and clean. We have nothing to do with that. We have to have a completely different notion of what uh, planning is about. You see, the key to the development of socialist planning is uh, the development of popular power. It's the development of our own capacity to control society. That's what socialist planning is about. And the key, therefore, is not nationalization, it's not state property, it's not uh, mechanical efficiency, and so on. It's our capacity. And our capacity, thank goodness, you might say, is a bit chaotic. And therefore, a slightly chaotic economy will be much preferable if we are beginning to establish control over it than the most perfectly planned thing, because the most perfectly planned thing will be planned by somebody else. Somebody will write that computer program, and somebody will run that computer, and we will find ourselves wired up uh, to run to somebody else's scheme. And that's nothing to do with socialism, whatever. You see, given a choice, it seems to me, between having elements of the market in the economy and having elements of the state bureaucrat in the economy, I prefer the market every time. Given the, if the choice is between those two things, then give me the market every time rather than the planning bureaucrat. Uh, because the market is better. In the market, because the market is not the fundamental enemy. It is capital that is the enemy. Capital develops the market, but capital is more than simply market competition. 
capital is fundamentally the expropriation of property by one class. And that is ruled out by the Socialist Revolution. The Socialist Revolution for a long, long time, for hundreds of years actually, comrades, will continue to use money and will continue to use the elements of the market in the distribution of goods and so on. Because actually, there is a little bit of truth in what the bourgeois economists say about the maximization of the choice and the rest of it. And given a choice between having somebody tell you what to want to consume and being able to spend money, I prefer to be able to spend the money. And actually, in practice, I think so will you. Now, okay, and lastly, and I'll stop because I've gone on too long. Um, the question of experts is uh, something which is often uh, an argument against socialism. That uh, really, of course, workers haven't got the capacity to uh, rule themselves, and the only people who can possibly rule them are people with uh, polytechnic degrees. Um, they're usually third class. Um, the experts, in other words, that we need experts to decide things, those who've been properly trained in things like uh, accountancy and uh, surgery, and all those other school teaching and all those other things that we all uh, learn. Now, the truth is that we can't wish away the problem of experts and of some sections of society having expert, more expertise than others for a period. We can't wish it away, even if that problem will be much less for us than it was, for example, for the Bolsheviks and for the Russian working class. Because, and the reason that the problem is quite less for us is because we live in a much more developed capitalist country than, of course, Tsarist Russia was in 1917. Firstly, you see, the development of the productive forces in Britain has meant the development of the working class. The most important productive force is the working class. And the working class in Britain is immensely more cultured and developed than the Russian workers were in 1970. Many of the workers that made the Russian Revolution couldn't read. Now, the working class in Britain is fantastically cultured, and therefore, to that extent, the need for experts, which means for those who have culture to decide things and run things, is very much less. Secondly, because, of course, one of the fortunate things which has characterized the capitalism is the process is that the working class is a constantly expanding class. And the very experts themselves, in particularly here in Britain since the war, have themselves been, as the, as the jargon goes, proletarianized to a degree, pulled towards the working class. If you look at the unionization of white-collar workers, the unionization of uh, professionals, and so on. We I mean, have to compare just a simple uh, compare two events from history. The 1926 general strike, when university almost, with the exception, I think, of the railway clubs, white-collar workers scabbed, and certainly professionals scabbed, and then you, look, you go to the next uh, big general strike in Europe, a comparable sort of event in 1968 in France, and you look at what happened, and you find uh, that the general strike is joined by millions of white-collar workers, that the uh, professionals, the technicians at the atomic nuclear plant, for example, set up a, uh, a month-long... Uh, seminar amongst themselves on how to convert nuclear power to peaceful purposes. There's a whole series of discussions among them. They themselves are deeply affected by the movement of 1968 in France. You know, you know that Marxists are never supposed to say these sorts of things, but in a sense, you can say the history is on our side, um, which is what you're only supposed to say when you're drunk. Now, um, nonetheless, having said that, although you can say, you know, there's that sense that Capitalism actually does prepare the preconditions for socialism, and certainly will be a great deal. It's, while it's harder to make the socialist revolution in Britain than it was in Russia, it's a great deal easier to finish it than it was in Russia. And we still have to say that there will be a problem about experts, and we'll, the, the class struggle won't stop after the revolution. A struggle within the working class and between the working levels, layers of the working class. There will be undoubtedly sections of, let's take a popular target, school teachers. Um, of uh, the comrades in the school teachers, not our comrades in the school teachers, there will be people in the school teachers who say, we have fought for years for professional control of the schools and now we insist on it. And we demand that uh, the school shall be indeed be run by teachers. And the revolutionary position will be, get lost. The schools will be run by those who go in the schools and the kids will have as much say in the schools and so on. There will be fantastic fights in the schools between the experts and uh, the consumers, as it were, and between uh, the local community and the teachers. And no question also. I mean, we'll have to do some terrible improvisations, and I would really like to end with this horrible thought, really. But uh, probably if there's one section of experts that is likely to desert Britain in large numbers if uh, the revolution doesn't spread over the world instantly, as doctors, I mean, the most corrupt and rotten lot, most of them, uh, we will be short of doctors. And we'll either have to say to them, you doctor, uh, uh, you, you will doctor, and if they still refuse, we'll have to run night classes, comrade.
you know, in, uh, we have to get the new doctors, like, I don't know if you know, Annie Neymat and some of the, Dave Widry and a few other comrades that know something about it, you know, to run evening classes and surgery, and we'll, you know, we'll have to, uh, we'll lose a few people, but socialism, socialism comrades is established in our own control. Okay.